University of Columbia, a special in the Shaw community, was home to many African American clubs and other associations in spite of the Great Depression and segregation. At the height of these difficult times in 1937, a group of photography enthusiasts established a club at the Colored Y. It was called the Anthony Boeing 12th Street YMCA Photography Club in 1940 and was renamed the Photocraft Camera Club. One of its earliest members, John H. Pinkard Jr., reaches his 100th birthday in 2011. He was born on the campus of Alabama A&M College where his parents were faculty members. Pinkard later relocated to the district Shaw neighborhood where he attended the Dunbar High School known for its decades of academic excellence. Pinkard graduated from Howard University, earning both a bachelor and a master's degree in physics. For three decades, he was a physicist with the National Bureau of Standards, where he was honored for his work on America's first guided missile, the BAT. For the BAT missile, Pinkard developed a 16 millimeter steel camera for information and retrieval purposes. Another one of his achievements at MBS was where he produced a kind of super microfiche that put over 100 info card images on a single 20 by 24 inch sheet of high definition film. I got involved with the photograph club through the Y. MCA, 12th Street YMCA in Washington, D.C. That was not my first uh, interest or introduction to photography, however. That started in the late 20s when a, a friend of the family who went to Howard University was bunking with us and he gave me a box camera and he also knew how to develop film. Hmm. And uh, Eastman used to sell these little packets, glass tubes of film, of uh, chemicals with which you could develop your film. And there was a big problem then with film curling up, so Eastman had a big deal with what they called non-curling film. So with me it was a box camera off and on until the 1930s, at which time I got an Argus 2AF, I believe it was. $12.50 and I started shooting pictures with that and uh, then I found out there was uh, an interest in st starting a camera club at uh, the YMCA, 12th Street YMCA. Actually it was the membership secretary John Enoch and this was 1940 and he was interested in learning how to take pictures better himself and Along with Edward Fletcher and John Enoch, we were essentially the founders of the YMCA Photograph Club. And we had free facilities at the Y. Uh, room 206, at the top of the stairs, was our dark room. So we had facilities there for learning photography and developing our own film and printing our own pictures. Um, the club from the very beginning was, I wanted to use the term interracial, but <laughs> <laughs> non-discriminatory. A fellow named Theodore Yetka, who was not black, was one of our first members. Uh, the YMCA at 12th Street, by the way, was a, pardon the expression, the colored YMCA. The white YMCA was downtown with fancy facilities and the YMCA on 12th Street did its best with a small swimming pool and um, classes, gym. By the way, the Y had a world-class weightlifting team and uh, also at the Y, by the way, was a Paragon Chess Club of which I was a member. Club was pretty good. We went up to Rutgers one time and beat Rutgers University. So the YMCA was um, uh, quite capable of holding its own with other YMCAs in the area. Now the YMCA club 
met every week. We had a meeting at which we discussed equipment, how to take the pictures. Then there was a meeting which was devoted to what might be called a contest or exhibit of, of pictures. And then there was another week. I've forgotten in what sequence these weeks went, but we had a modeling session week. And uh, I've forgotten what the fourth week of the month, of every month was. But anyway, it was structured so that uh, each week we had a different activity. And uh, somehow I got to be the archivist of this club, and I still have the original notes. And we are actually the oldest active club in the uh, D.C., the Washington area, having been started with proof in the 1940s. Now actually in 1938 something called the National Photographic Society was meeting on government property, segregated, which was really I guess illegal, but they were the only club that could probably claim to being older, uh, having been organized in 1938. And they have proof in the way that they were, um, I don't want to use the term syndicated, but uh, they were uh, properly organized. Now a member of our club, who came in later in the 60s, I believe, found that in 1937 there was interest in photography at the YMCA. And he claims that 1937 was actually the starting time of interest in photography at the uh, 12th Street YMCA. So he likes to put uh, 1937 at our, as our starting time, which would actually make us the oldest existing, oldest active uh, camera club in the, uh, in the whole Washington area. I had a degree in physics and the government was hard up for finding qualified physicists, and it turned out that they didn't know I existed. It seemed that when I went to interview people for a job in the government as a physicist, there were no openings for me. It seems like uh, I was the wrong car. So I said, I'm going to write the President of the United States and let him know what's going on. And then as I started to compose this letter, I said, I'm going above the head of the United States of America. I'm going to write his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. And so I wrote Eleanor Roosevelt. In two weeks, I had a job as a physicist in the National Bureau of Standards. And at that time, uh, it happened that the, uh, the Navy came to the Bureau of Standards that was a part of the Commerce Department, by the way. The Navy came into the Bureau of Standards with a project called the BAT. And this was the very first guided missile project. Uh, radar, at that time, was very high secret. And uh, I was part of the team that worked on the BAT. And my uh, particular activity involved a camera which was attached to this, uh, it was a glider, it wasn't powered. Uh, we attached a camera called GSAP, gun, gun sight aiming point camera, to this bat. And this bat was supposed to monitor the flight of the uh, experimental bats and I had the job of operating, having this camera operate with 16 millimeter film. That's what I was dealing with mostly here. And to track the flight of these um, experimental bats. One of the uh, interesting things about the Photograph Club's uh, relationship with the Moreland Spingarn Research Center at Howard University is that in many ways it was initiated 
uh, when the Research Center became the National Repository for the National Newspaper Publishers Association. It was very clear that many of their participants were members of the black press, and many of them were located in Washington, D.C. As the center began its major campaign in documenting black history and culture, we realized that that group of photographers would be an important ingredient in our documentation, and we began to work with many local photographers and trying to determine the nature of their work and what they had that helped to document our past history. As we began to do so, we came into contact with the Photograph Club, to which many of them belong, and we thought that we might be able to afford an opportunity for many of these photographers to be able to archive their work so that it would be a, a, an important part of the documentation of black history and culture. The um, club had members who sort of monitored or recorded significant events in the city, which was published in papers. Actually, um, Ellsworth Davis, a member of the club, was the first um, black photographer to be hired by the Washington Post. And he, um, I think he worked mostly in the dark room, but he, among the other professional photographers, had stories dealing with uh, the goings on in the Washington area, especially in the Southwest. At that time, the Southwest was um, a low cultural end of Washington, D.C., you might say. And uh, a friend of mine in a photograph named uh, Joseph Curtis, who lived in the Southwest, went about recording the pictures of what happened to the Southwest and when they started tearing down and rebuilding the Southwest. And he got such a combination of such a wide variety uh, of pictures that he, um, he didn't publish a book, but he did have um, a show, a series of pictures of the redevelopment of the Southwest in Washington. And now I believe Southwest Washington is one of the uh, developments where um, people are very glad to live and be. And it was, uh, it is now completely, you might call, integrated. I'm trying to get away from that term. But <laughs> Usually, if we did capture photos that were of significance in the history of the city, we sort of didn't know what to do with it. And uh, people from the outside would come to us and get pictures which they use with other stories. By the way, during my um, college years, I was inducted into a small fraternity called Gamma Tall. And in this fraternity was a fellow that I cultivated a friendship with. His name was Robert McNeil, who was a professional photographer. Actually, he was employed by the State Department as the, um, I don't know whether his term was chief photographer, but he was head of whatever the State Department was doing in a photographic manner, including pictures of State Department officials, and uh, he was also in charge of the uh, photo laboratory. Now, Bob and I were into taking our photo essays to other clubs in the area, and we developed a way of judging. When you got invited to a club in the Washington area, we would show our photo essays, and then we would judge a competition with that club. It was um, a routine that we would show our photo essays, which at that time was new to many of the clubs, and we got a good reception with that. And then we would act as judges with the photography of the club. And my experience with judging also owed a lot to um, Ed Flynn, who passed away recently, by the way. He was very good at that, and Bob McNeil was also very good at that, as was Raymond Hundred Dollar Massey, who was um, 
a character on the radio. He was, uh, with his excellent delivery and voice, was a master at producing photo essays. And we became sort of well known in the area. And uh, between Ed Flynn, the National Photographic Society, Society and the Photograph Club, we developed a way of using the output of all the area clubs and taking their slide color competi uh, competitions, shuffle these slides together and organize them into categories and make a, uh, what you might call a wide photo essay out of the competition in the entire area. The way the, the National Photographic Society did it was um, very interesting indeed. They had, to say, animals, people, different categories, and the, photo, the uh, Photograph Club also did that. But it turned out that other photograph, other clubs, photography clubs in the area, didn't seem quite to know how to do this. So the idea died out after a couple of years, uh, which was too bad because it took a lot of uh, imagination. By the way, in 1940, I was the first one to bring Kodachrome to the Photograph Club. I never will forget it. That stuff, ASA 10, basic photography of a nature scene was F63 to 60th. That got burned into my memory for many years. I understand now that Kodachrome is no longer processed. It's gone. You can't get it. It had brilliant colors at the time. In fact, its, it's color uh, qualities were prized by many photographers all through the years. As it turned out, it was actually a part of my life. And uh, my first wife, named Mary, by the way, remarkable woman, took this Argus 2 camera to um, a series of lectures that she was attending and uh, in the um, in the New England area she was very good at writing and was going to work on a book so she took my little $12.50 camera along with her and took a remarkable series of color pictures on Kodachrome and came back and won quite a bit of note in the club they could hardly believe that she could do this. So she was a part of my history with this photograph club. And each week, I could count on my attendance to the YMCA photograph club. Now that's every week, week after week, no breaks for the summer. And, uh, when I got to be elected an officer of the Photograph Club, it was a remarkable boost to my ego. I spent three terms as president, and each time that I got elected president, it uh, gave my ego a tremendous boost. By the way, the Photograph Club has a basic organization that is not an organization. It runs on the idea of a benevolent despot, <laughs> a benevolent dictator. It turns out that in 1943, a fellow by the name of James R. Barres, a remarkable fellow in the, uh, in the government, who had the ability to direct people. And he sort of took the club over as its benevolent dictator, as you might say. One photo out of history probably would have been um, a picture of my great aunt and father. At the time, he was recounting his days at uh, Tuskegee Institute and receiving his diploma in 1899 from Booker T. Washington. A series of pictures of my 
aunts and uncles who lived at a time that I did not live, and their stories would come back to me as I, uh, as it turned out, as the Photograph Club had its headquarters, as you might say, in the YMCA, it turned out that in 1983, we got put out of the Y, you might say. And there was a danger of the club um, losing its home or place of existence. And we were sort of saved, you might, you might say, by one of the members of the club called Francis Butler, who was a member of 19th Street Baptist Church. And so he arranged for the photograph club to meet at the 19th Street Baptist Church. And this church adopted us as a club, allowed us a meeting place, and Francis Butler followed James Barres, as you might say, as a father of the club, although he was a different kind of, um, of a uh, dictator who was not a dictator. And uh, although we had different presidents, it was Francis Butler who was then sort of, quote, running the club. Meanwhile, uh, James Barres had passed away, and the mantle of the leader of the club became Francis Butler. It turns out that the Photograph Club has existed this way, with all, always a, uh, a, benevolent, a benevolent dictator who was running the club. And uh, business meetings were not necessary, it seems. The treasurer was um, taken as taken on, uh, you might say, uh, on um, on his own record, <laughs> his own recognizance. He was trusted. The 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 uh, treasurer was always somebody who worked for years and maybe kept the money in a cigar box in his uh, closet, which actually happened, by the way, a fellow by the name of Lewis, he was our treasurer for some 14 years back in the early 1940s and 50s. This informal way seemed to work with Photograph Club. We've seen clubs uh, almost dissolve themselves with arguments over parliamentary procedure and qualifications for prints in, uh, in their contests. We developed uh, these uh, qualifications, but we were very loose usually in, uh, in following them. Now, along with uh, Francis Butler, other persons joined the club who were remarkable in their dedication to the club. Irene Kellogg was uh, one of these persons, and uh, as it happened, Francis Butler passed away, and uh, our new benevolent dictator became Irene Kellogg, who was not a dictator at all, but just a, a mother figure, who pardon the expression, who carried the club regardless of who was president or what the officers were. This seemed to work with the Photograph Club. I don't know if you can write this idea up, but somebody ought to realize that uh, you can have an organization that can ex exist without a lot of um, formal regulations and uh, constitutions and so forth. Although we developed those, we can lean back on them in case uh, it's necessary. I think the club has indicated that an organization has to have dedicated members with individual visions which can coalesce and be important to these individuals so that uh, the organization can be important uh, in, in its existence. One of the um, important things, as I recall, with the Photograph Club was when it comes to the treasury, by the way, most marriages have most troubles, I understand, with money. 
and this applies to organizations also, but the photograph club has never had enough money in its treasury to be worth fighting over, so we have always been tolerant of money matters in the photograph club. As a matter of fact, let's go back to Bob McNeil. One of the members of the club, Ellsworth Davis, lost his camera. He was at the time working with the Washington Post. Bob McNeil comes up out of his pocket with $500 to give him. Many Money changing in the photographic tempo <laughs> was something that we tolerated. And uh, was one of the things that uh, I think contributed to the long-term existence of the